Hello, my name is Amir. I'm pleased to say that I'm a dental surgeon and I'm here to talk to you about a sore throat and I'm here to talk to you about glandular fever. So if you look at somebody's mouth, like I do all day, and the mouth was red and the tonsils were inflamed and the pharynx was inflamed, it is likely, isn't it, that we are dealing with a viral pharyngitis. That is the collective name we give to a whole group of viruses which can do this, a whole list of them. Like the common cold viruses, the echo viruses, the adenoviruses, the Coxsackie viruses, the Coxsackie A and the Coxsackie B, the rhinoviruses and influenza. And then there are these three specific fevers which can cause you a sore throat like mumps, measles, whooping cough, etc. They all cause a viral pharyngitis. They're all spread by droplet infection, by sneezing and by coughing, by sneezing and coughing on your children, on your colleagues and your partner. And they all give you a sore throat and fever. An enlargement of the jugular lymph nodes in the neck the jugular lymph glands. They may be associated with muscle pain, particularly so if you're dealing with Coxsackie. Coxsackie B, myalgia, is sometimes referred to as bone home disease after the island of the North German coast where it was first discovered. But severe muscle pain are a feature of Coxsackie B and sometimes there is a rash and sometimes there is a thing called hand, foot and mouth disease which is viral in origin and nothing to do incidentally with foot and mouth disease in cattle. You make a diagnosis which is entirely clinical. So if you looked at somebody's mouth and it was red and the tonsils were inflamed you will be dealing with a viral pharyngitis. You take a white blood count, but that will come back as normal because we're dealing with a virus. You may, if you're enthusiastic, take a swab or a throat washing. And if you are very enthusiastic, like your good self, and dealing with Coxsackie and Echo, you take fetal specimens and actually look for the virus. There are no complications and patients usually recover very quick. And the treatment is analgesics, honey and bed and loads of love and patients recover real quick. And it's an extremely common cause of a sore throat. And you see it very much often. Now, the next cause of a sore throat is caused by a specific virus, the Epstein-Barr virus, obviously named after the people who discovered it in 1964, and it causes glandular fever. It causes fever and a sore throat, common amongst 10 to 20 year olds, but it's ubiquitous. 95% of us have had it. And there has always been, been and there always will be a great deal of interest in this virus because of the way it's associated with cancer. That is certain children, some children in tropical Africa, they get generalized cancer of the lymph nodes. It's called Burkitt's lymphoma. And these children show positive with the Epstein-Barr virus. But more important still, in China, but I suppose the rest of the world as well, but particularly so in China, there is a thing called a retropharyngeal carcinoma or a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And these patients certainly show positive with the Epstein-Barr virus. So the next thing you want to ask is what does ordinary glandular fever do to you? Well, it causes fever and a sore throat, a very severe sore throat in some people. 
and enlargement of the draining lymph nodes in the neck, not just in the neck, but in the groins and in the axilla. So you get generalized lymphadenopathy and enlargement of the spleen. So if you see a young person who's got generalized lymphadenopathy with a severe sore throat and splenomegaly, you make a diagnosis of glandular fever and you would be right. So the next thing is, what, what other things happen with glandular fever? Well, you've heard of other viruses which can damage the liver and cause hepatitis like virus A, virus B, virus C, the Delta virus and virus E. Well, there is another one, Epstein-Barr virus, infectious mononucleosis where patients become jaundice. They become febrile and that is how sometimes they first present. If you look in the mouth, you often see exudate, and on the tonsils you actually see membrane. If you look in the heart palate and the soap palate, you will see little capillary hemorrhages, petechiae, eyes, and sometimes there is even a rash, which looks a little bit like measles, so we call it more biliform like measles. And there is great deal of swelling, and there is great deal of oedema. And some patients go on later to develop inflammation of the brain, encephalitis. Some patients go on to develop inflammation of the peripheral nerves. So you make a diagnosis that is entirely clinical, and you would be right. But the test to make positive diagnosis for glandular fever is the Paul Bunnell test. I need not bother telling you exactly how it works. It's an antibody test. And by using various antigens from guinea pig and oxen, we can differentiate it into Paul Bunnell positive, that is glandular fever, or Paul Bunnell negative. But a better way of doing that, of course, is actually to look for viral capsid antibodies. And early on, it would be immunoglobulin M, IgM, and later on, it would be IgG, immunoglobulin G. Now, the problem with glandular fever is that it has many impersonators. That is, there is a whole group a whole series of other infections which can bring about the same kind of things with a sore throat, generalized lymphadenopathy, a skin rash, and even splenomegaly. There is an infection caused by the cytomegalovirus, and there is a thing called toxoplasmosis. Neither of them you've probably ever heard of, but you have heard of AIDS. Because AIDS can start with a picture and a clinical diagnosis very much like infectious mononucleosis. But the thing about these are, they are poor banal negative. So we can differentiate them into either that or other. Now the other thing about glandular fever is that it makes you jolly well ill. It's very serious. And some patients take a long time to recover from it. And they may even be accused of suffering from myalgic encephalomyelitis, the ME syndrome. It used to be all thought that it was in the mind, but we now know that they have an immunological abnormality, which makes them a long time, eight months, a whole year perhaps. It used to be caused, called post-viral rehabilitation. But it now has a very respectable term, the adenine syndrome or myalgic encephalomyelitis, the ME syndrome. So you have to be very patient with these patients. Two other things happen. Because of all the respiratory obstruction, because of all the edema, because of all the swelling, patients find it very difficult to swallow. And that is very serious, and that may even have to be treated by tracheostomy. Another interesting thing which happens is, 
the spleen, which enlarges, becomes very febrile, and ruptures spontaneously. You've heard of the spleen rupturing. If somebody sticks a knife into you or thumps you hard in the stomach, you will collapse with severe abdominal pain and go into an intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Well, there is another one, a disease which can, patients can present occasionally, very occasionally, with the spleen rupturing spontaneously. And that is how they first come to the a &E. So glandular fever, a very important cause of a sore throat. The kissing disease is ubiquitous. Many of us have had it. A great deal of interest in it because of cancer. Great deal of interest because of the way she associates herself with cancer.